I can't stop thinking about what you said before that if you snack or or in some of in some patients if they snack before a meal it changes their metabolic response to that meal so I wonder if we could just dive into that a little bit so let's say you're going to have your dinner at 6 p.m but at 4 30 p.m you have I don't know a cake piece of cake you know with a cup of tea how might that impact the same meal that someone has at 6 p.m. if they've not had that cake? Well, it's going to vary for different people because I've told you there's this uh, unique response. But we're generally seeing a higher uh, insulin and glucose peak. uh, If they've snacked before. If they've snacked before. So there'll be more stress on the body uh, having snacked than if they hadn't eaten at all. Um, it will depend on the time of day and other things like this, because again, it's not a simple, you know, black and white type relationship. Sure. But but everything that you eat, you do before you have whatever it is you're eating, has a role in that response to that meal. And so, uh, for most people who have anything to eat before that time uh, that will induce a sugar surge will cause an even bigger one in the subsequent meal. Okay, so so this is why once you start thinking of food in a different way as a chemical reaction in, a, in your body, you realize that you don't want to have these big sugar peaks, these fat peaks after food. You want to, yeah, you, know, you accept some of them, but you want to balance it for your body so that your body's not overreacting all the time and in a sort of stressed, inflamed state, which is what we think is happening for people on very bad diets. They're just constantly stressing the body, the insulin is being pumped up, inflammation levels go up, vessels start getting inflamed, long-term stress equals weight gain and you know, concentration problems and uh, energy problems. So what you know, getting a good night's sleep, having a good rest between meals, um, trying to work out whether you should be eating your food early in the morning or late at night, depending on your particular circadian rhythm all these things are important but absolutely we should be eating less meals we should be having two decent meals a day um, rather than this standard six which we are now uh, being told it is still the right way to eat oh and buy the you know just happen to be this these these uh, cheap snack foods you can you can buy that parents are told is good for their children you know and it's just complete nonsense uh, we have to break that cycle, realize, break it down again, and start you know, people experimenting and getting people used to, and kids particularly. You know, you imagine a child that's used to eating six or seven times a day. How do they cope with a fast? You know, they, they, you know, after two two hours, they're they're conditioned to start looking for something else to eat. Uh, whereas the French kid, the Spanish kid, the Italian kid, they'll be patient. They'll wait. You know, and they'll wait for some decent food. And I think that's the other thing. It's this conditioning that's yeah. maybe just as bad as this metabolic uh, problem. So, yeah, and I think that the uncomfortable truth for, for many of us as parents is that our behavior can also condition our own kids, right? So what they mm-hmm. see us doing, and if we've, let's say, picked up habits that maybe ideally we would change, but we haven't, yet our kids are around us and seeing it, they're also going to pick up that as well. And I think, you know, I say that as a reminder to myself, just be careful how much you snack. You know, it's not it's not like looking down on anyone. It's, it's purely understanding that we're, we're all susceptible. Um, but these religious, you know, but uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, fasting and, and virtually every religion has had fasting in there as a way of training, um, you know, as, as a sort of health thing and bonding the community together. But... I think it's a great training for for kids uh, to be able to fast for a period of time to so, realize that you don't you're not going to die if you don't <laughs> eat you know and you you just wait until the next day or uh, you know when the sun goes down or whatever it is uh, and and it's very sad that we you know it's slowly being lost and certainly in the Christian world it's virtually lost. Uh, and it's only the other other religions that do it, but uh, but 
bringing back, you know, some non-religious fast day yeah. um, for the whole family might be a, a fun thing that everyone should do, you know, that um, with what? a big feast at the end to, yeah. uh, to celebrate. Yeah, you're right. This sort of feast famine type pattern that we've no doubt had in evolution. How can we bring that back? When you say you're a fan of fasting, um, what do you mean by fasting? Because if I don't clarify this, we'll get a ton of questions afterwards. What do you mean by fasting? Are you talking about intermittent fasting, time restricted eating, how many hours? You know, all those questions will come up. So I'd love to know what, what does Professor Tim Spector think of fasting? Well, firstly, uh, everything in moderation. So I'm not uh, someone who believes in multiple day fasting. Um, you know, I've never fasted for more than 24 hours and uh, I <clears throat> wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but I, I do think just in general principle, the idea of going on a fast psychologically is really important so that you remember what hunger is really like and you remember that you can distract yourself from hunger and that also, you can paint a nice picture of you know, having this enormous breakfast the next day, and amazingly, you can fall asleep and get around it. So until I started doing it, I, I didn't believe that was sort of possible. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought, I'm too weak. I'm not going to be able to do that. But so the, just the principle of any, any fast, um, it, it's quite a, just a thing to do for your own psychological well-being, I think. Uh, to realize that we've, you know, we've got this, we've got these chemicals in our brain, and they're telling us to do this, and but you can switch them off, you can divert them, you know, when you don't have to, it's fine. And most of us will come across some medical thing that we have to fast, yeah. uh, but you, we're usually just distracted by that medical thing that we do it, and if you t and that, that's interesting that uh, yeah. that's quite easy, um, but when you do it voluntarily, it's somewhat harder. So the principle is, I, I like it. Um, I was a big fan of uh, intermittent fasting when it first came out because it allowed you to um, eat less food, but not in a restricted way. So you could have, a, you could pick what the food was you were going to eat and just had only a quarter of the amount on that day. And I don't think it was shown to be better than any other diets, but you could stay on it for longer because you had the variety, you could change it all. It wasn't dull. It didn't, you know, didn't interfere with uh, anything else. And um, when you say intermittent fasting, Tim, can you, would you mind just elaborating on what that means exactly? Okay. So intermittent fasting, I'm talking about things like the 5-2 diet. So you would have um, two days during the week, not consecutive, where you would have 25% of your normal calories. And, or, or some people would have less, but yeah. it, it would be the idea that you'd really reduce it down, um, maybe just have an apple and uh, a bit of clear soup and um, uh, something in the evening. I always had a glass of red wine as a treat in the evening, but uh, <laughs> which, which used up most of my uh, allowance. <laughs> um, uh, and then the next day you, you could compensate, do whatever you liked really. So that, that it was, a, and you could do that for two days a week and most people found they did lose weight or was a way of controlling weight that didn't give you the, the same uh, rebound that you got with uh, calorie counting or doing anything like that. Now, like all things, it tends out to be not as you know, amazing as, as we, th we thought, uh, but it, it did allow a lot of people to carry on doing it for years. And I do have people who have been doing it for years. Uh, and every now and again, they just say, okay, I'll just have a hungry day and do that. And to my mind, because they're not changing the food they eat, it can still be healthy. I like that. It's not like they're having something out of a can or a, you know, artificial uh, milkshake or a, yeah. a low cal product. They're not going and saying, I'm going to get zero calorie, this and that. You can have exactly normal natural foods. Um, but when, what is interesting at the moment is that is time restricted feeding, yeah, um, which is a lot of the news at the moment. Um, and has very uh, a lot of animal data supporting it, but so far hasn't lived up to expectations in the clinical trials. Interestingly, so there've been a couple of trials recently where it hasn't sh shown to be as dramatic as you would expect from the um, uh, the the animal studies. And it could be that again, this individuality. We, those trials always look at the averages. Yeah, and. 
it could be that some people would benefit from a different time scale. Um, for some people, it isn't enough. Some people might be too much. And so I would still advise everybody to give it a go. And particularly this idea of whether you're a morning person or an evening person. In our studies, um, when we gave identical muffins to people every uh, three hours or every four hours across the day, uh, most people's um, metabolic peaks, these, these, these stress peaks I was telling you about, got less uh, during the day. Um, so, uh, yes, so no, the other way, they, they, they went up during the day. So three out of four people got worse during the day with the same food. Um, one in four people actually uh, got better. So, and I was one of them. So it suggests that uh, for some people, eating later in the day would be better than eating early in the day. So some people are morning people, and like the dogma tells us, you metabolize better your carbohydrates in the morning, you break it down quicker, you get less of a sugar peak eating the identical food. And we compared lots of people doing this, but one in four people, it's the opposite. Wow. So some people are better off not having a large breakfast, um, or so either skipping breakfast and having uh, a lunch and a, and a big evening meal, like most people in the Mediterranean, uh, those people will do better. So again, it's all about self-experimentation. There isn't one size fits all. And there's many complicated bits go into food. Yeah. And it, it, it's necessary to maybe deconstruct it all without losing the, you know, the fun bits of eating. Yeah, because I, I, there is this huge social side that's really important, mustn't lose sight of. But let's not stop eating breakfast just because everyone says you have to eat breakfast. And they say, well, mummy, I'm not hungry. Well, you know, try it for a week without breakfast and see. Yeah. You know, it's not going to kill them. Um, and if it doesn't work out, you, you know, you change your mind. But generally, humans are pretty good at, if you listen to your body, it will yeah. tell you, most people are not starving when they wake up in the morning. You don't wake up at 7.30 say, oh, my God, you know, I've got to eat something, you know. <laughs> and so that – and some people, they don't get any feeling of hunger until, you know, maybe 11, 12 o'clock. Yeah. I think the main thing for me is if I sort of – which what I always try and do is try and relay what you're telling me from the science and this kind of cutting-edge science that you're involved with – and I'm sort of trying to relay it to what I've seen with my own patients. Go, well, how does that marry up with what I've seen? It really fits so beautifully that, first of all, everyone's different. Secondly, we got to, I think we've got to, it's about empowerment and responsibility in the sense that I think too, too many of us are relying on some external source to tell us what is the right diet for us? You know, doctor, you tell me, what should I eat? And, and I think we can provide guidance, but I kind of feel the only way to really own it long-term is for you to feel it and go, actually, you know what? I don't really care what anyone else is doing because when I have my breakfast at 10 a.m., and let's say I eat until I have a dinner at 7 p.m., actually, you know what? That seems to work for me. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.